Section 1. The Advanced Trenches of Between the Lines by Boyd Cable. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Near blank, on the dash dot front, a section of advanced trench changed hands several times, finally remaining in our possession. For perhaps the twentieth time in half an hour, the lookout man in the advanced trench raised his head cautiously over the parapet and peered out into the darkness. A drizzling rain made it almost impossible to see beyond a few yards ahead, but then the German trench was not more than fifty yards off, and the space between was crisscrossed and interlaced and a bristle with the tangle of barbed wire defences erected by both sides. For the twentieth time the lookout peered and twisted his head sideways to listen, and for the twentieth time he was just lowering his head beneath the sheltering parapet when he stopped and stiffened into rigidity. There was no sound apart from the sharp cracks of the rifles near at hand, and running diminuendo along the trenches into a rising and falling stutter of reports, the frequent whine and whistle of the more distant bullets, and the quick hiss and zip of the nearer ones, all sounds so constant and normal that the lookout paid no heed to them, put them, as it were, out of the focus of his hearing, and strained to catch the fainter but far more significant sound of a footstep squelching in the mud, the snip of a wire-cutter at work, the low tang of a jarred wire. A few hundred yards down the line, a dazzling light sprang out, hung suspended, and slowly floated down, glowing nebulous in the misty rain, and throwing a soft radiance and dusky shadows and gleaming lines of silver along the parapets and wire entanglements. Intent, the lookout stared to his front for a moment, flung muzzle over the parapet and butt to shoulder, and snapped a quick shot at one of the darker blotches that lay prone beyond the outer tangles of wire. The blotch jerked and sprawled, and the lookout shouted, slipped out the catch of his magazine cut off, and pumped out the rounds as fast as his fingers could work bolt and trigger. The stabbing flashes of the discharge lighting with sharp vivid glares his tense features, set teeth and scowling eyes. There was a pause, and stillness, for the space of a couple of quick-drawn breaths, and then pandemonium. The forward trench flamed and blazed with spouts of rifle fire, its slightly curved length clearly defined from end to end by the spitting flashes. Very lights and magnesium flares turned the darkness to ghastly vivid light, the fierce red and orange of bursting bombs and grenades threw splashes of angry colour on the glistening wet parapets. The flat khaki caps of the British, the dark overcoats of the Germans struggling and hacking in the barbed wires. The eye was confused with the medley of leaping lights and shadows. The ear was dazed with the clamour and uproar of cracking rifles, screaming bullets and shattering bombs. The oaths and yells, the shouted orders, the groans and outcries of the wounded. Then from overhead came a savage rush and shriek, a flash of light that showed vivid even amidst the confusion of light, a harder, more vicious crash than all the other crashing reports, and the shrapnel ripped down along the line of the German trench that erupted struggling, hurrying knots of men. A call from the trench telephone, or the sound of the burst of bomb and rifle fire, had brought the gunners on the jump for their loaded pieces, and once more the guns were taking a hand. Shell after shell roared up overhead, and lashed the ground with shrapnel, and for a moment the attack flinched and hung back and swayed uncertainly under the cruel hail, for a moment only, and then it surged on again, seethed and eddied in agitated whirlpools amongst the stakes and strands of the torturing wires, came on again, and with a roar of hate and frenzied triumph leaped at the low parapet. The parapet flamed and roared again in gusts of rapid fire, and the front ranks of the attackers withered and went down in struggling heaps before it. But the ranks behind came on fiercely and poured in over the trench. The lights flickered and danced on plunging bayonets and polished butts. The savage voices of the killing machines were drowned in the more savage clamour of the human fighter, and then comparative silence fell on the trench. The attack had succeeded. The Germans were in, and, save for one little knot of men who had escaped at the last minute, the defenders were killed, wounded, or taken prisoners. 
The captured trench was shaped like the curve of a tall, thin capital D, a short communication trench leading in to either end from the main firing trench that formed the back of the D, and a prolongation outwards from it. The curve was in German hands, but no sooner was this certain than the main trench sprang to angry life. The Germans in the captured curve worked in a desperation of haste, pulling sandbags from what had been the face of the trench and heaving them into place to make a breastwork on the new front, while reinforcements rushed across from the German side and opened fire at the main British trench a score of yards away. Then, before the gasping takers of the trench could clear the dead and wounded from under their feet, before they could refill their emptied magazines or settle themselves to new footholds and elbow rests, the British counter-attack was launched. It was ushered in by a shattering burst of shrapnel. The word had passed to the gunners, careful and minute adjustments had been made, the muzzles had swung round a fraction, and then suddenly and quick as the men could fling in a round, slam the breach and pull the firing lever, shell after shell had leapt roaring on their way to sweep the trench that had been British, but now was enemy. For ten or fifteen seconds the shrapnel hailed fiercely on the cowering trench, then, at another word down the telephone, the fire shut off abruptly, to reopen almost immediately further forward over the main German trenches. From the main British trench an officer leaped. Another and another heaved themselves over the parapet, and in an instant the long level edge of the trench was crowded with scrambling, struggling men. With a hoarse yell they flung themselves forward, and the lost trench spouted a whirlwind of fire and lead to meet their rush. But the German defenders had no fair chance of resistance. Their new parapet was not half formed, and offered no protection to the stream of bullets that sleeted in on them from rifles and maxims on their flanks. The charging British infantry carried hand grenades and bombs and flung them ahead of them as they ran. And finally, there was no thicket of barbed wire to check the swing and impetus of the rush. The trench was reached, and again the clamor of voices raised in fear and pain the hoarse rancor of hate, the shrill agony of death, rose high on the sounds of battle. The rush swept up on the trench, engulfed it as a wave engulfed the cleft on a rock beach, boiled and eddied about it, and then, and then, swept roaring over it and on. The counter-attack had succeeded, and the victors were pushing their advantage home in an attack on the main German trench. The remnants of the German defenders were swept back, fighting hopelessly but none the less fiercely. Supports poured out to their assistance, and for a full five minutes the fight raged and swayed in the open between the trenches and among the wire entanglements. The men who fell were trampled, squirming underfoot in the bloody mire and mud. The fighters stabbed and hacked and struck at short arm length, fell even to using fists and fingers when the press was too close for weapon play and swing. But the attack died out at last, without the German entanglements being passed or their earthwork being reached. Here and there an odd man had scrambled and torn away through the wire, only to fall on or before the parapet. Others hung limp or writhing feebly to free themselves from the clutching hooks of the wire. Both sides withdrew, panting and nursing their dripping wounds to the shelter of their trenches, and both left their dead sprawled in trampled ooze, or stayed to help their wounded crawling painfully back to cover. Immediately the British set about rebuilding their shattered trench and parapet, but before they had well begun the spades had to be flung down again and the rifles snatched to repel another fierce assault. This time a storm of bombs, hand grenades, rifle grenades, and every other fiendish device of high explosives preceded the attack. The trench was wrecked and rent and torn, sections were solidly blown in, and other sections were flung out bodily in yawning crevasses and craters. From end to end the line was wrapped in billowing clouds of reeking smoke, and starred with bursts of fire. The defenders flattened themselves close against the forward parapet that shook and trembled beneath them like a live thing under the rending blasts. The rifles still cracked up and down the line, but in the main the soaking clay-smeared men held still and hung on, grimly waiting and saving their full magazines for the rush they knew would follow. It came at last, and the men breathed a sigh of relief at the escape it meant from the rain of high explosives. It was their turn now, 
and the roar of their rifle fire rang out, and the bomb throwers raised themselves to hurl their carefully saved missiles on the advancing mass. The mass reeled and split and melted under the fire, but fresh troops were behind and pushing it on, and once more it flooded in on the trench. Again the British trench had become German, although here and there throughout its length knots of men still fought on, unheeding how the fight had gone elsewhere in the line, and intent solely on their own little circle of slaughter. But this time the German success was hardly made before it was blotted out. The British supports had been pushed up to the disputed point, and as the remnants of the last defenders straggled back, they met the fierce rush of the new and fresh force. This time it was quicker work. The trench by now was shattered and wrecked out of all semblance to a defensive work. The edge of the new attack swirled up to it, lipped over, and fell bodily into it. For a bare minute the defense fought, but it was overborne and wiped out in that time. The British flung in on top of the defenders like terriers into a rat pit, and the fighters snarled and worried and scuffled and clutched and tore at each other, more like savage brutes than men. The defense was not broken or driven out, it was killed out, and lunging bayonet or smashing butt caught and finished the few that tried to struggle and claw away out up the slippery trench sides. Hard on the heels of the victorious attackers came a swarm of men running and staggering to the trench with filled sandbags over their shoulders. As the front of the attack passed on over the wrecked trench, and pressed the Germans back across the open, the sandbags were flung down and heaped scientifically in the criss-cross of a fresh breastwork. Other men, laden with coils of wire and stakes and hammers, ran out in front and fell to work erecting a fresh entanglement. In five minutes, or ten, for minutes are hard to count and tally at such a time and in such work, the new defense was complete, and the fighters in the open ran back and leapt over into cover. Once more a steady crackle of rifle fire ran quivering up and down the line, and from their own trenches the Germans could see, in the light of the flares, a new breastwork facing them, a new entanglement waiting to trap them, a steady stream of fire spitting and sparkling along the line. They could see, too, the heaped dead between the lines, and in their own thinned ranks make some reckoning of the cost of the attempt. The attempt was over. There were a few score dead, lying in ones and twos and little clumped heaps in the black mud. The disputed trench was a reeking shambles of dead and wounded. The turn of the stretcher-bearers and the Red Cross workers had come. There would be another column to add to the casualty list presently, and another bundle of telegrams to be dispatched to the next of kin. And tomorrow... The official dispatch would mention the matter coldly and tersely, and the papers would repeat it, and a million eyes would read with little understanding. Changed hands several times, finally remaining in our possession. End of section one.